Hello. 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 Welcome back to What, what the, Death the Death Podcast. What a great episode last week, right? When we talked about dating, relationships. relationships, and our stories and experiences with that. Whew. And some of your responses to it were pretty impressive. Yes. And it means so much to us just to be able to talk and have that dialogue. Yeah. So today we got an interesting question from a listener, and we thought it would be a great episode idea to talk about our careers. One question was, what do we do for a living other than a podcast? Prior, after, what's our goals? Well, what a great question. In college, my major was communication studies and sociology. I was a double major. Obviously, my passion is to work with people. But during that time frame, I didn't really find exactly what my passion was and what I really wanted to do. And then a job opportunity opened up in Nebraska. Like I previously mentioned in our last episode, I was a behavioral health coordinator. So that job opened up. And during that time, I was also considering becoming a school counselor. So again, I want to work with people and help them. That was always been part of my life. And that's my, my goals. So I went ahead and applied and I got that job, which was great because it gave me an opportunity to move back home and be with my family after being so far away for such a long time. And that job was truly truly amazing. It made me grow so much as a person, especially as a deaf person and understanding my rights. So as a behavioral health coordinator, I didn't just work with behavioral health. I wore many different hats, but in general, I would say that I advocated for deaf people in the state of Nebraska to make sure that they had full access. Or if they had any issues and they needed assistance relating to courts or any different situations, I was there to advocate and make sure that they had communication access. And it was truly, I have a lot of crazy stories and a lot of great success stories. For example, we were able to successfully pass a legislative bill to recognize American Sign Language as a language. And another situation is providing hearing aids to deaf children and deaf adults who can't afford them. And in case you didn't know, hearing aids are ridiculously expensive. (laughs) Oh, I know. So expensive. And a lot of deaf and hard of hearing people out there cannot afford them. And insurance doesn't cover it. Right. So there was just a lot of little things that we worked on in those roles. And one thing I want to ask you too, and for those listeners who don't know, You said recognizing ASL as a language. So does that mean ASL is not a language in Nebraska or all over? In some states, it's already passed. And other states, they actually don't recognize ASL as an official language. And our goal was to make sure that they recognize it as a language, which makes it easier for us to be able to hopefully have ASL classes in schools. Some schools will say, no, I can't provide ASL classes because it's not even recognized as a language. And so they do others like Spanish class or French class or other language when ASL would actually be very beneficial. And so recognizing it as a language. And what blows my mind is ASL not being recognized as a language because it's literally my language. That's how I receive my education. That's how I communicate with my family members. And I literally live in this world and my own language is not even recognized. And so it's just so weird. But yes, there's more and more states that are passing that bill to recognize it as a language. And I'm so thankful for all the deaf leaders and deaf organizations that have worked so hard to make this happen for every state, especially for our deaf children's future. It's it's so critical. That's amazing. And then after... You finished with that. Yes. I loved working with people. I loved the atmosphere. I just wanted to do something more with it. And so I decided that I was done. It was time. And I, I've done my part here. And so I decided to quit my job. And yes, during 2020. Ooh, so the risk. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people looked at me like I was insane. But something told me that I had to do it. And so I left my job. I sold my house, beautiful house, my first home. So I sold it and I packed everything that I could fit into my SUV and I had Sarah come and help me pack the rest and went ahead and moved to California to start something new. And so now I'm still working on my networking. I started some ASL consultant jobs in the entertainment industry and 
holy cow, it is a new experience for me. It's such a fun journey for sure. Now I'm still exploring for the next chapter of my life, but I know that it's, it's got to be something that allows me to make a difference in the world and work with the deaf community. That's my passion. You're already making a difference in this world, in my world too. <laughs> Thanks. So Carly mentioned the entertainment industry. I come from that background. Both my parents are in the industry. My dad an actor and my mom used to be an actress and now she's a writer, producer, and director. So it's a part of me. But even though it's a part of me, I never thought I could do it when I was little. I never saw someone who looked like me as an actor. And I thought you have to be like this cookie cutter actor. And I just didn't think I could. So I decided to shift gears and become a teacher because I wanted to get back to kids and wanted to inspire them to chase their dreams. So I went to college for teaching and then maybe my junior, sophomore, junior year of college, my dad reached out to me and said, hey, I have a casting director friend of mine and they said that they have this amazing role for you if you want to audition. So I was kind of hesitant, not sure about it. And then I was like, okay, fine, I'll try it. So I went into the audition room and I booked my first role right there and then. I was on a TV show called Switch at Birth. Unfortunately, my scene did get cut, but I was on it, I promise. And it changed my whole life. I realized, no, I can become an actress. I can break that glass ceiling. I want to show people in the mainstream world that you don't have to be this perfect actor. There's no such thing as a perfect person in this world. I want to inspire people, no matter what you look like, what obstacles you may face, that you can achieve your goals and dreams. So that is my passion, and it's to become an actor and inspire people to see the many different kinds of beautiful people in this world. And with that being said, I do presentations, inspirational speaking, talking to college students, conferences, families, and also I sign ASL songs. I started with Hamilton. Which was beautiful. And... With that, I started working with Disney and did some of their songs. And like you said, our goal in this world, in this life, is to inspire and make an impact in the listeners and you guys, the audience and the mainstream platform to show our worth and our inspirational stories. And no matter what obstacles that we face, there's so many beautiful things that come after it. And remember when you and I sat down and we were manifesting our dreams. And of course, we wanted to do something together. And then we got that opportunity to do a presentation at a college together. And oh my goodness, the whole process of that was so smooth to the point where we looked at each other and we're like, not only are we best friends, but we work together so well. And that's one of the main reasons why I followed my instincts and left my job to move here because I knew that you and I would make a difference in this world. And so we're still navigating through our journey and we're just so excited to see what the future holds for us. But our presentation, (laughs) it was amazing. (laughs) It was the best. Those college students were speechless about it. And it was cool to see us present together because we said before in other episodes, we come from completely different backgrounds and upbringings. And our perspectives are so different, but yet so similar. And for those audience to see that live and to ask whatever questions about our lives and to see our connection, it's really something that's so special. And speaking of you being a part of the entertainment industry, lately I have actually been dipping my toes in and wow, it's a completely different experience. And I can only imagine how different it was for you to have me in the picture In the previous episode, we talked about how you were able to channel between two different worlds. And before I got here, you didn't use an interpreter and those little things. And now that I'm here, I require an interpreter. And so that process of requesting an interpreter and the process of using an interpreter really changed the dynamic with the people in the entertainment industry who've worked with you for a long time and now see like, oh, that's why it's so important to have an interpreter on set and why it's important to have an ASL consultant be a part of the filming process. And so it was just really nice to see how we can 
present a picture and show how important communication access is for deaf and hard of hearing people, which is my passion. And your passion is to act and do your job without worrying about asking for accessibility. And so I just really enjoyed that journey. Beautifully said. And with that, I think we have a few more questions related with working and jobs and career. And thank you again for your submissions. We're so excited to continue with the dialogue. And this is from Wes from Maryland asking, do you trust your interpreter? And when they translate for a hearing audience, do you trust them? Well, yes and no. I am very picky with my interpreters. They have to have a level of professionalism because I've had experiences on TV sets where my interpreters were not professional to the point where I had to kick them out of set. Because, for example, there was one interpreter who wanted to take pictures with the main actor. There was another one that wanted to chill and eat. And one even called out my name to get my attention. And I was like, did you just call my name? And he was like, yeah, but you can hear. Uh, so there is certain level of professionalism interpreters need to have. And if I notice there's no professionalism, then I will stand up for myself and for my rights and make sure that I get the accessibility I need for that. But there are some interpreters who are amazing that I do trust. You just have to find that right fit. Yes, I, I'm also very picky with interpreters within the community. And it's tough because I'm not like you. I can't hear and make sure that the interpreter is voicing correctly for me. And I also know that I sign fast. I know that. And so it's really hard to find an interpreter who's capable of keeping up with me and understand me clearly and translate into English quick enough. And so some will stop me in the middle of a presentation and tell me to slow down. And granted, I get it. And it's my responsibility to coordinate and see the cues with my interpreter. But the fact that they stopped me in the middle of my presentation to tell me to hold on, I'm like, I'm in the middle of my presentation. I'm on a roll. So just don't. And I think it's really important for me that I make sure I work with the interpreter prior to the job, especially when I'm giving a presentation, you know, say to a business or a, a business audience, I need to make sure that the interpreter understands the verbiage I'm going to be using and what kind of information I'm going to be facilitating so that the interpreter can properly prepare themselves. And that's kind of how I gauge my interpreters to see if they're prepared enough. If they don't reach out to me prior and say, hey, Carly, I'm working on this day for you. Is there any important information that I should be aware of? And they just show up the day of, I'm prepared. I'm probably not going to use them again. It's important to have that conversation prior. And also, sometimes I even work in a courthouse and I'm particular on which interpreter I use because I work hard to understand the court system and the terminology that they use. And so I have an educational background related to that field. And so I'm capable of standing up and advocating for deaf individuals there. But does the interpreter have that capability? Do they know how to facilitate from sign language to English? And so it's really important for them to understand the process too. And so I always have to analyze to see which interpreter is the best fit. So overall, I always want to trust my interpreters. And sometimes I have bad experiences and maybe another deaf individual has a great experience without an interpreter and they might just be a better fit and it wasn't for me. So overall, I'm very picky. I just make sure that I communicate with my interpreters on the side and establish cues and just get everything prepared. Yeah, and I'm still learning because now, like you said before, I'm now finally having my rights of getting an interpreter and I'm still trying to figure out what I want and need and how to voice for myself when I feel like it's not a good fit or if I need an adjustment on something. So I'm still growing. But like you said, I hope to be able to trust my interpreters all the way. Right. So here's another good one. Yeah. This is from Teresa from North Carolina. She asks, it's a little bit long. If you were giving a presentation to the executives of AMC movie theaters in an attempt to persuade them to add closed captioning to your movies, what would your main argument be? Our main argument is deaf and hard of hearing people are not the only ones that need captioning. There's a lot of people out there that 
need captioning. And this would actually benefit everybody in the end and not just the deaf and hard of hearing population. I actually had an interesting experience with captioning in movie theaters. I went to a movie with a friend that was hearing and they have those hideous captioning glasses that they provide. And granted, it's nice to have accommodations, but after wearing those things for a two hour movie, I get horrible headaches, horrible because the captioning so in your face and then you've got the movie in the background and it's pinching your nose. It hurts. Not only that, they have like the captions are literally at the bottom of your glasses and you cannot lose your head. Right. And there's also like the another kind of captioning too that like you fit in your cup holder and then you like jerry rig it and like move it and sometimes it doesn't work. And then gradually it'll just fall into your lap. <laughs> <laughs> or even worse, if somebody wants to get up and have to move in front of you, you have to like move it back and then they'll pass and then you have to like readjust to fit the screen again. And again with Sarah, when she loves her food and drinks and she's got limited space. I'm like, uh, I have to hold it so close. <laughs> But anyways, so I had noticed that there wasn't very many people in the auditorium that day for that movie. So I went ahead and found the manager that was on duty that day. And I said, hey, do you think you can turn on the open captioning? And just to let you know, it's not hard to do. It's overall, it's just a switch that you turn on for the theaters, but they typically don't do it. So I went ahead and asked the manager and the manager said, well, only if everybody in the auditorium agrees and you have to ask them. And I was kind of taken back. I'm like, me? Okay, well, I, I guess at this point, I'll do anything to get open captioning anyways. So I went into that theater and asked every single person on my phone and said, would you be fine if we had open captioning on the screen? And everybody said yes, all the way up until I got to the back row. There is a guy who was a middle-aged man. He read it and gave me the biggest attitude, rolled his eyes and said, mm, no. And so I was like, Ugh, okay, it's just one guy out of everybody in that theater. So I continued to ask everybody else. And I showed the manager and I said, everybody said yes, except for one gentleman. And then the manager said, well, then we can't do it. And I'm like, you're basing that off of one person. Everybody else in the theater said it was okay. But so I went ahead and went back into the theater just to see if everybody else would say something, you know, and say, Hey, like, I thought we were going to have open captioning or say something to that gentleman that said no, but nobody did. They just kind of let it go. And I just said, you know what? I can't do this. So I got up and I walked out and I said, I'm done and I want a refund. And so they were like, oh, okay, are you sure? They gave me a free ticket to come back and they gave me my money back. And I'm like, what makes you think that I would want to return after what just happened? You know, and so it's just really interesting. All their arguments about not being able to put on closed captioning due to financial reasons or it's too distracting for them. And I'm like, little do you know, People have closed captioning on all the time at home. And it's actually really beneficial in the end. It's funny too, because I actually have a deaf actor friend of mine. She made a short film with her friend and she wanted to take a poll on Instagram from her hearing audience to see what their preference was for their accessibility. And the whole film was in American Sign Language ASL. So she asked, would you prefer a voiceover for the ASL part or would you prefer closed captioning for the ASL part? And like 90, 95% of them said they wanted closed captioning, not voiceover. And they said it is because voiceover is too distracting from ASL. They want to be able to read the, the subtitles and if they need to, to match the ASL. And I'm like, what's the difference between that and what I need as a definite individual? So that put things into perspective for me that people don't realize other people need sometimes. And even though it makes a small inconvenience for them, it helps another person out too. And also not only movie theaters, but YouTube videos. I absolutely hate it when they go ahead and use auto-generated captioning without actually editing the captioning. And the response is, well, it's a lot of work. And I'm like, we spent hours putting captions on this podcast for everybody. And plus, you have the advantage of being able to translate using your voice, which is way easier while we have to type from scratch because I don't have the capability of hearing the recording on this podcast. And so, and if you have the chance and you want to test it out yourself, just find a YouTube video that didn't create their own captioning and they use the auto-generated captioning 
just mute the video and read the captioning and see if you even understand it because some of the captioning does not match at all or it's delayed and it just, and it takes so much work for me to actually read all the captioning and even figure out what they're trying to say. And I think for the people who actually use real closed captioning and take that extra effort, they get more deaf followers anyways. So it's great. I think we have another question too. Yes. This is from Dylan from Kansas City. What are the, some of the most common forms of discrimination that the deaf community faces? Whew. Hmm. Huh. Well. It's a lot to that question. It's a very loaded question. It's also a sticky question. The most common form. Uh, honestly, there's a, a variety. The only thing that I can really imagine is communication access is businesses. They'll say, oh, I have to hire an interpreter for you. I don't know. That's going to cost money. And I'm not going to want to hire you because for you, I'd have to bring in an interpreter and spend the money on that. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't want to use an interpreter for my auditions sometimes. And I called you out on that. Yeah, you called me out for using your privilege. Because there are a lot of deaf people who can't just switch gears and start talking. And we need those interpreters. And the fact that sometimes society puts that pressure on me to make me realize that my privilege is being taken advantage of. And that's unfortunate as well. But now I'm definitely more aware of it. And that discrimination of if I tell them I need an interpreter, they'll say no because it costs more money and I'm out of a job. I literally had one individual tell me that I had to bring my own interpreter. <laughs> that's an often thing. And I had to pay for it. And I'm like, mm, no, no. <laughs> That's not my responsibility. And I don't even make enough to pay for my own interpreter. <laughs> so excuse me. <laughs> so most, most of the time, I think it's related to communication needs. But I mean, we are discriminated so many times, whether it's a small situation or a big situation, if it's intended, not intended, or even recognized. It's just, it's, it's little things. Yeah. And again, I talked about the entertainment industry and a discrimination that happened that hurts us is when there's a deaf role and the hearing person gets put in that role instead of a deaf person. And that hurts my heart. Like you lose that authentic representation within that industry. And there's so many wonderful deaf actors out there and they put a hearing person for that deaf role because it's, maybe easier for them, or it, they don't want to take that extra effort to communicate with a deaf actor. So there's little things like that. And then when the deaf community calls them out and says, hey, you should have a deaf individual in that role, they get defensive and say that we're being too nitpicky or we're being mean instead of understanding that we're just really screaming for our own rights, where our roles, our culture, our language, and you're taking that away from us and using it without respecting us. And so it's just really interesting. And, and also I experienced a discriminating moment that wasn't just about me being deaf, but I remember when I was giving a presentation to a law enforcement audience, I gave my presentation, it went really well. And their executive director of corrections came up to me and we had a good discussion and they said, wow, like you are the perfect person to give this presentation because you're just so pretty to look at. And you're just, and I'm just so fascinated with your signing. And I'm like, okay, pump the brakes. What the deaf? <laughs> right. I just, I, I, ugh. I worked so hard to get to where I'm at. I worked so hard to make sure that I knew my shit to give this presentation and educate and you come at me and say, you're just beautiful. And they enjoyed looking at me and my signs were intriguing. And I'm just like, and this was from an executive director of corrections. And I just, I was completely turned upside down. I left and went to my boss and I expressed how I felt. And I was just like, wow, like, wow. And so that's another thing that I get frustrated with. You know, people just think that, oh, wow, the sign language is so beautiful. Instead of truly taking away what I'm trying to teach them, 
to do their to do their own jobs right. And so that really really took away from all of my hard work that I put into in just that one statement. And this is why we have this podcast to continue to educate you guys and give you the listeners something to think about after this and have that open discussion with other people and see each other's perspectives. And we're just two women. Maybe other deaf people have different experiences and that's fine. It's just the experiences we faced. And other deaf people also experience different forms of discrimination and they have their own stories to tell. So maybe we have to hear them out and do a little unpacking ourselves. And sometimes it's not recognized, it's not intended. And then we get that, but we experience it every day. Good question. I really appreciate you asking that. Yeah, I know it's not an easy question to answer. So we hope we answered your question well. Again, if you have any curious questions, go ahead and email us and not just questions, but just have discussions with us. We would love that. And follow, follow us, us on Instagram at what the deaf for all of the updates and please subscribe to our podcast and we'll see you next week. Next week. Bye guys. Bye.